Happy Easter, my fellow Midnight Masters. Today I have some special stories just for you. But before starting, please don't forget to spread some Easter cheer by liking this video and leaving a comment down below. And if you're new here, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and join us for more thrilling creepypastas. Now let's start. People often say that Easter is religious in nature, that it's something Christian or pagan in origin. I'm here to tell you that it's something far different than you've ever dreamed. I grew up in a small town in Northern Europe, one of those picturesque little villages that you see on postcards, the kind with lots of farms, a cute little main street area that's all cobbled stone and brick buildings, a little downtown area with an open air market, and lots of hard-working people in rustic clothes with various farming implements, herding animals to and fro. I lived above one of those shops with my parents. They ran a general store, and I helped out until I left when I was 16. They were good people, and I don't think they really agreed with what happened. They weren't the kind of people who fell in with religious fervor, but they understood its purpose, the purpose it serves for the community, and they participated, even if unwillingly. The celebration of Lady Ostry was not as old as the village itself, but almost. On Easter Sunday, twelve of the town's children were pushed from their homes and led into the square in the middle of town. Their ages were between six and fifteen, and the event was always preceded by merriment before the night itself. There was a carnival that week. Feasts were eaten, gifts were given, and then the night that everyone dreaded inevitably came. I don't remember much about those nights. I remember the underlying dread I felt as I sat in my room. I remember the silent tears I cried without knowing why. I remember the relief I felt when I'd awaken the next morning to see that it was daylight again. That end the screams. I still hear the screams sometimes when the nightmares come. To understand why this happens, you'd first have to understand Our Lady. The Lady Eoster was once a hallowed deity. She was the goddess of dawn and the rays she brought had nourished the land for the founders of the region. The Oster had shown them where to go, where to plant, and the bountiful harvest made the towns rich and the cities prosper. They praised her for her generosity and gifts, but she told them too late that there was a price. You see, she hadn't told them what else lay in that valley. There's a cave near Father's Glen, a huge dank maw that breeds nothing but shadows and pain. Those who go in never come out and it's where the children of Eostre reside. Legend says that once they were birds, creatures of the wind who were free to fly as they would, Eoster turned them into hares, an animal more fitting for a season of fertility and growth. The hares were pleased with this, now free to explore the land they had seen from above. But over time they grew to hate the children of men, who often hunted them and their smaller cousins. When the people moved into the valley they began to hunt the rabbits for food, which infuriated the hares. The valley was said to be thick with rabbits and hares at one point, but the humans were in for a surprise as they filled their stew pots. The hares began to come out at night to hunt the men, and many of the hares and the humans died as a result. The ensuing skirmishes were good for no one, so Eostra stepped in. In her infinite wisdom, Eostra brokered a trade, a contest of sorts. If you would hunt the humans, then give them the same chance you have. For one night, the weakest of them will hide and run from sunset to sunrise, and any you catch will be your prize. Once a year, you will send twelve of your young ones, one for each month you have hunted the hares, and they will search for them. If they find them, they may take them back to their cave. Those not found will be free to go about their lives until called upon again. My hares will remain below the ground for every other night, never to hunt a human under my protection. This is my decree, and all shall abide. And so it has been from that day on. I was chosen only once to participate in the festival. The town wasn't huge. Maybe thirty or forty children of the desired age at any given time, and it wasn't uncommon for a name to come out of the kettle more than once. 
My friend Maria was chosen four times but managed to hide until dawn on all but the last time. A sibling could go in your place and sometimes they did. One year I remember a boy named Ellen went in his sister's place and was supposed to have killed three of the hares before they got him. I never saw the bodies. Everything was cleaned up. As it always was when we all came out the next day. Most years, I just sat in my room with the doors and windows locked as I cried into my arms and tried not to listen to the children below as they screamed. Most years, only a few lucky kids came back. I was fortunate enough to come back when I was selected. I suppose I wouldn't be telling you this story otherwise. I was eight when I went out to do my duty, as my mother put it. I was scared, but a part of me just couldn't believe I would die or never come back. I was young, and all children believed themselves to be immortal. Hell, even the thought of rabbits coming to get me made me giggle. I could just imagine little bunnies with torches and pitchforks hopping along as they tried to catch a bunch of terrified children. Even as the nun told us about it in the local school, I giggled a little, earning a smack with the ruler for my insolence. You won't think it's so funny when you're in the street some night and they come for you. I saw my father's face when my name was drawn and couldn't understand his terror. I had heard the screams, of course but I believed they were just people putting on. I knew that people got killed, but I didn't believe it. Why would my parents send me out to do something that could get me killed? My parents loved me, and I knew they wouldn't want me to come to harm. I was confident that this was like Father Christmas or the Tooth Fairy, just a bit of harmless hogwash for children. I had never actually known any of the children that didn't return, so it was like nothing had changed from year to year. How small my world was and how frightening it seems now that I was so naive. So I sat at the feasts, played the games, and enjoyed myself that week. I saw some of the other children who'd been chosen, and while some looked scared, others clearly didn't grasp what was in store either. They joked about rabbit hunts and bringing carrots to feed the bunnies. We all laughed and talked about how brave we would be, but none of us really understood what was about to happen to us. Then came Sunday night, and I think it all became real to me. My mother called me into the kitchen just as the sun began to sparkle at the edge of the horizon. She presented me with some gifts for tonight. She had bought me a pair of soft black pants and a very tight shirt. She put a pair of soft shoes on my feet, and I could feel their delicate material hug me gratefully. Listen to me very closely because what I tell you might save your life. On the night I was chosen to participate, I hid in the horse shed near the drawbridge. The smell of hay seemed to make me harder to find, and if you bury yourself deep in the stack, you should be safe until morning. Don't try to fight them. Don't be careless or brash. Just run and hide and survive. I love you, your father loves you, and we wish there was any other way but this one. We wish there was some way to help you, my father said suddenly, coming in from his study and startling me. But this is all we can offer you. Good luck. We hope to see you in the morning. Then they hugged me, both of them enveloping me in their shared embrace, before leading me to the door and showing me out into the semi-darkness. I walked to the square, unafraid as the gas lights flared cheerfully. Why should I be afraid? This was my home. I had run over these streets with my friends. We had played by the fountain in the square. We had gone to the market and bought candy and toys with our allowance and we had gossiped and giggled as we walked to school. Nothing here could hurt us. Nothing here could threaten us, as the warm stones of our hometown wrapped us in a cocoon of safety. This was just a game that grown-ups played, and it would prove as hollow as the stories of the boogeyman or the goblins who came to take away naughty children. I could see the others as they filtered into the square, but there was no quiet chatter or laughter now. As the sun set, casting the last of its light on the town, we heard the bell toll and saw the mayor come out on the balcony that overlooked the square. He looked resplendent in his long coat, his shoes with the buckles gleaming in the dancing torchlight, as he stared down at us from his high perch. He looked sorry to see us here, but resolute in his decision. He would carry this out, and then he would step back inside so he didn't have to watch the results of his actions. We give thanks to Eoster for a bountiful harvest, for the valley where we live and for the gifts she has given us generations ago. We ask her to watch over these little ones as they hide from her children. May she take pity on them and let them come home again. He said more, going on for what felt like hours, 
but my head had turned from him as I heard the noise. It was the harsh flop of two large feet, the echoing thump of heavy footsteps. And as I looked, I saw them. There were three of them, all tall and lithe, with arms and legs too long to be human. They didn't so much walk as they galumphed, as if walking on two legs was never something that would become normal for them. As the mayor droned on, I saw one of them become too eager and step close to the edge of the alley they were hiding in. His fur was snowy white, a speckling of brown making him look as though he had freckles from his chest to his nose. Around his neck and across his shoulders, to my surprise, were feathers. And I remembered suddenly that they had once been birds. His mouth had a distinctly beakish look, and I felt cold dread creep into me as this creature hulked at the ready. It held a delicate-looking flint knife in its too large hand, and my humor at the thought of being hunted by bunnies was gone now. These were not the cute hopping creatures you sometimes saw in the glen. These were like the trolls and goblins we were told stories about, old and mean and utterly devoid of human kindness. As the sun sets, I beg you all to flee. Go now before they are set loose by that ancient promise. Some of the others had seen them too, and I was suddenly aware that the press around me was thinning. Children of all ages were running, fleeing into the corridors and alleys we all knew so well. I was running too, leaving behind the few who still gaped at the mayor as he moved away. They would give me time to run as the creatures found them first. Their screams were high and terrified, but mercifully short. I ran for the stables, just like Mother had told me to, but the hares didn't stay in the square for long. The streets echoed with those strange hopping thuds, and I could hear them as they caught others. The children were easy to track. They wept. Their feet thudded loudly. Their breathing was much too deep, and the hares seemed to locate them easily as I ran for my life. Unlike the others, my shoes seemed to whisper over the cobbles. They were soft, hugging my feet like a second skin, and though the night was breezy, I never heard my clothes so much as a flap. I was like a shadow as I traversed the streets of my home, and when I saw the bridge looming up in the distance, I put on an extra burst of speed. When I heard the flapping, galumphing sound of those wide, flat feet, I threw myself against a nearby wall and stayed as quiet as possible. I could hear it as its feet slapped at the hard cobbles, its nose twitching as it tasted air that likely stank of humanity. The sound of its twitching nose made my skin crawl. The noise akin to bugs as they nest beneath a loose cobble. I put a hand over my mouth as my fearful breathing threatened to give me away. I couldn't tell you how long I stood there, time seeming to creep by as the creature looked and sniffed. Fear time is always different from actual time, and the stretch of seconds can take decades in that moment of extreme terror. Then mercifully he left, and I ran like the rabbit I had become for the stables. The stables were empty, the horses taken elsewhere, but the hay trough still remained. I plunged into the itchy depths, making myself into a ball as I shuddered at the bottom of the pile. The clothes my mother had given me were long-sleeved and legged, so I had only to cover my face so the itchy depths wouldn't give me away. The scent of hay was strong and the dust that coated me made me stifle a sneeze. I had to be silent. I couldn't do anything to give myself away. I lay at the bottom of that trough for hours, my adrenaline running high and my ears straining for the smallest sound. I heard them when they came in the first time. There had to be at least two of them. Their feet slapped at the cobbles as they searched the stalls. I heard the turnover tubs, open closets where only horse tack waited, and grumble in their strange language when they found nothing. When one of them came towards the hay trough, I thought I was done for. It dug through the hay, pulling handfuls away as it searched, and I pressed myself as flat against the bottom as I could manage. I had to stuff my fist into my mouth, careful not to rustle the hay for fear that I would begin screaming at the thought of those creatures being so close to me. My fist was sweaty, the taste of hay and dust likely to choke me, but I held absolutely still as it threatened to uncover my hiding spot. When it sneezed, the dust getting into its nose, I almost sighed in relief. It scooped out a few more handfuls before stopping, sneezing again as it moved away. Those deep thumps took it out of the horse stall, and I was left to shiver and shake as my adrenaline coursed fresh through me. Somehow, as the adrenaline ebbed and my body began to ache, I fell asleep at the bottom of the trough. When I awoke, it was daytime, 
and the night of terror was at an end. My mother found me, Hay still clinging to me as I walked towards home. She pulled me close and kissed my hair, thanking Eoster for my safe return. Given that Eoster had been responsible for what had happened last night, it seemed silly to thank her. That night was 15 years ago, and I've since moved from my small rural town. Hamburg makes the place I was born look like a dirt track, and after college I found work as a foreman in a textile mill. My parents call me once a week, sending letters in this age of email instead of getting with the times. I've settled down now, had a child of my own, and our conversations always seem to turn to when they will get to meet their grandson. My answer is always the same. When you come to Hamburg to see him, after what I've witnessed in that place, after sitting in my room for eight years with the knowledge of what was going on outside the walls of my house, I will be damned if I let my son anywhere close to their warren or those snuffling monstrosities. So when you hear of the resurrection, as you bite the ears off your chocolate bunny, count yourself lucky that you live without the fear that was such a part of my childhood. Remember that somewhere there is a bunny that would love nothing more than to bite the ears off of you. Did I know something was wrong the moment I woke up that Easter morning? Looking back, I think I did. Even if I didn't know exactly what it was that had made my eyes snap open. There was no reason for me to be awake. I remember thinking. The sun had barely come up, filling the house with the hushed golden light of dawn. I tiptoed down the hallway, hoping to avoid waking up my parents and breaking the spell. There was a tension in the air. A kind of anticipation that I couldn't explain. Not at first. I had already made my way down the stairs when I remembered. It was Easter Sunday. The Easter Bunny was coming. I was seven years old that fateful April morning, and every Easter I could remember so far had featured a hunt for colorful candy-filled eggs. And now that I'd woken up early, I might even get to see the Easter Bunny for myself. I was still wondering if I'd get in trouble for peeking out the window when I heard a knock at the door. Even though my heart was pounding with excitement, the sudden sound still scared me, and I felt the shadow of a doubt cross my mind before I unlocked the door. Who would visit our house at Six Ma on a Sunday morning? Had something bad happened? When I pulled on the heavy brass handle, however, I let out a sigh of relief. Everything was fine, it was just the Easter Bunny. The man-sized, floppy-eared, fur-covered figure stood on the porch holding a wicker basket. Wow, I muttered to myself. Then, are you for real? Some of the kids in class say you don't even exist, you know. The Easter Bunny didn't respond. As if to confirm my suspicions, I reached out and stroked its fur. It felt sort of fake, like the mascots at Chuck E. Cheese's. The tall figure didn't budge, didn't react to my touch at all. It just stared down at me with those enormous, unblinking plastic eyes. Then it gestured to the basket. A scroll-like note lay on the minty plastic grass, tied with a bright yellow ribbon. A grin spread across my face as I unraveled it and read the fancy, handwritten letters it contained. You've been chosen for a special Easter egg hunt. Me? I pointed to my chest, eyes wide. The Easter bunny nodded. Well, um... I frowned. I'd better ask my parents. Bang! The tall, furry figure had slammed shut the front door to my house with a single powerful paw. I gulped. I hadn't wanted to make the Easter Bunny angry, especially now that I realized just how big it was. The foggy streets were silent. Not even a bird sang. It was like the whole world was empty, except for me and the Easter Bunny. I tried to swallow again, but my throat was dry. I looked up at the black windows of my parents' bedroom. If I woke them now, I'd get in trouble for sneaking downstairs, for being outside, for spying on the Easter Bunny, who could even guess how long I'd be grounded for. Meanwhile, if I just went on one quick Easter egg hunt, I could be back before they even knew I was gone. Besides, I'd been chosen. Who knew what special things the Easter Bunny had in store for me? I shivered. The morning mist was cold and there was something unnerving about the way the Easter Bunny kept staring at me. Okay, I shrugged. Let's go. And the Easter Bunny led me away across the dewy grass. The fog was so thick I could barely see anything apart from the sea of bright green around us, and the Easter Bunny's tail, 
bobbing ahead of me like a will-o'-the-wisp. I had a feeling I knew where we were, however. The enormous lawn of the nursing home behind my parents' house. I even thought I could see its lights on the hill to the right, and make out the dark shapes of pine trees beyond that. Then, suddenly, the Easter Bunny stopped and set down the basket. It still hadn't spoken a word. Instead, it pointed at the ground straight ahead. It was time for me to start searching. The fog had lifted a bit, and the dew felt good on my bare feet. But it was kind of unnerving how the Easter Bunny kept following so close behind me, like a silent giant. When I found the first egg, however, my doubts vanished. It was pink plastic, just like I was used to, and inside was a shiny golden ring. My jaw dropped at the sight of how it glittered in the early morning light. Is this real gold? I gasped. The Easter Bunny nodded. Is it for me? The big furry figure nodded again. I slipped the heavy golden thing around my finger careful not to let it fall, and went in search of the next egg. I couldn't help but get distracted by the ring as I walked. The more I looked at it, the more something about it seemed familiar. The sight of a blue plastic egg badly hidden beside a stream up ahead chased the thought out of my mind. If the last egg had contained a golden ring, what might be inside of this one? My yelp of joy died in my throat when I cracked it open. The blue egg only held a dog biscuit. The exact same brand that I usually gave to the family golden retriever, Rolf. And speaking of Rolf, I hadn't seen or heard him at all when I woke up, even though he usually barked his head off at every little sound. Um, okay. I forced myself to smile up at the Easter Bunny, the same smile I reserved for my aunt when she gave me clothes that smelled like mothballs for Christmas. With the gold ring still heavy on my small hand, I slipped the treat into my pocket and went looking for more eggs. The third one I found was bigger than the other two. It was bright yellow with blue dots, almost impossible to miss, and it was located on the edge of the pine forest. In fact, all of the eggs the Easter Bunny had left for me seemed to be leading me in that direction, away from the lights of my neighborhood and toward the darkness of the woods. I thought of the breadcrumb trail from Hansel and Gretel, remembered the horrible old witch in her candy cabin, and shuddered. My parents had told me to never go into the woods alone, but I was with the Easter Bunny, so it had to be all right. And anyway, I wanted to find out what was inside that big egg. This time I recognized the contents right away. These, these are my father's glasses, I muttered. What are they doing here? Of course, the Easter Bunny didn't answer. I couldn't help but imagine the huge furry figure in front of me climbing onto the roof of my house, silently sliding open my parents' bedroom window, sneaking inside, and grabbing the glasses from my father's bedside table. But why would the Easter Bunny do such a thing? My father was as blind as a bat without the wireframe glasses that I was currently holding in my hands. A sense of foreboding crept into my bones. Another egg, a purple one this time, sparkled beside a mossy stone just inside the forest, but I realized I didn't want to go after it. The sun was higher in the sky now. The mist was almost gone. I could see the nursing home clearly up on the hill and hear the sounds of birds and car tires from the comforting confines of my neighborhood. That world. The world of family breakfasts and the bright yellow school buses. The world without the Easter Bunny suddenly felt very far away. I, I don't think I want to play anymore, I muttered in a small voice. The Easter Bunny's ears flopped as it bent its head to the side, a gesture that was comical and hostile at the same time. There was nowhere to hide from the black centers of its unblinking plastic eyes. Suddenly and with surprising violence it stabbed its paw toward the heart of the forest. It shuffled its furry feet toward me menacingly, urging me on toward the woods. I bit my lip and started walking toward the purple egg. The Easter Bunny's furry gray feet crunched over the pine needles. It was following closer and closer behind me, full of misgivings. I stooped to open the purple egg. When I did, something round, slick, and crimson slid into my hand. I dropped it with a yelp of horror. It was a real, human finger. There was something about it I recognized too. My mother's nail polish. 
Suddenly I realized where the gold ring had come from. I was wearing my parents' wedding band. I gasped and took a step backward. The woods felt vast and dark indeed. What? What's going on? I felt tears welling up in the corner of my eyes. I want to go home! I want to see my mom and dad! The Easter Bunny's paw shot down and grabbed my wrist. It was dragging me deeper into the forest. I yelled and squirmed, but another mitt of fake fur clamped down over my mouth. It didn't smell like springtime or candy. Its odor was sour, rotten, and wrong. Up ahead was another egg, a bright orange one laying among some dead pine branches. I don't wanna... I mumbled through the fur, but the Easter Bunny forced my hand down onto the cheap plastic. Part of me was afraid to open it. The other part was filled with morbid curiosity, a sick need to know what was inside. Something round and whitish red rolled out with a splat. Pine needles stuck to its white, veiny surface, and a foul white liquid oozed from where it had been ruptured. My father's bright blue eye stared up at me from the forest floor. Why are you doing this? I screamed at the Easter Bunny. This deep in the woods it was so dark that the morning still felt like night. Even so, I could make out other colorful shapes glimmering in the gloom. More eggs. I had no desire to know what awful secrets they contained. The Easter Bunny tugged insistently on my wrist. It was so big, so strong. How could I ever get away from it? Or was I going to spend what was left of my life searching these shadowy woods for those terrible plastic eggs? I forced myself to start walking toward the nearest egg. There was no sound but the snap of sticks beneath my feet and the wheezing, excited breaths of the giant, furry thing beside me. Now that I wasn't struggling against it, the Easter Bunny had loosened its grip somewhat. Furthermore, I realized that its huge paw wasn't very bendable. It couldn't close around my scrawny seven-year-old wrist quite the same way that a human hand could. That gave me an idea. The Easter Bunny was big. The Easter Bunny was strong. The Easter Bunny was terrifying. But was it fast? My arm was slick with sweat, and when I ripped it out from the Easter Bunny's grip, the furry monstrosity's gasp of surprise and anger seemed to echo through the trees. I ran. I ran until my lungs burned, dodging through narrow gaps between the trees and slipping through the undergrowth, where I hoped my nightmarish pursuer couldn't follow. There was no turning back now. I didn't want to think what it would do to me if it got a hold of me again. I might even end up inside a few of those colorful plastic eggs. The heavy thump-thump of its footfalls behind me reverberated against the forest floor. It was catching up. The bright lawn beyond the trees grew closer and closer with every step. Then suddenly I was through, bursting out into dewy grass and sunlight. But not before I felt a furry paw graze the back of my neck. I didn't stop running until I was on the patio of the nursing home at the edge of the neighborhood. The old folks in their wicker chairs observed me curiously as I stared down at the edge of the forest, where I could barely make out a man-sized shape with floppy bunny ears watching me from within the shadow of the trees. The nurse who I told my story to probably didn't believe or understand a word of it, but he could tell from my thorn-ripped clothing and dirty, tear-stained face that something was very wrong. The police met me on the nursing home porch, and when I showed them the way back to my house, it was the two officers, not me, who found the grisly scene waiting inside. According to the medical examiner, the rest of my family had already been dead for hours when I woke up that Sunday morning. At first, the officers struggled not to laugh when I cried that the Easter Bunny got them. Of course, that was before people started opening those strange plastic eggs that had appeared in the woods. Now, 13 years later, the case is still unsolved. I went to live with my aunt several states away, and she worked hard to protect me from the grim memory of what had happened. To this day, I still don't know what I met on my front porch on that foggy Easter morning. A serial killer in a fursuit? Some kind of supernatural being? I have no idea. All I know is the warning that I plan to pass on to my own children. If the Easter Bunny invites you on an egg hunt, don't go. When I was little, I had this fascination of catching any of the well-known make-believe characters my parents had told me about all of my short life. 
Santa being number one on my list. I had tried to stay up late Christmas Eve night for the past three years, hoping to come face to face with the big man himself. Although I have never gotten my chance to meet the man, I did however meet the Easter Bunny. I was an only child, so now I see that it were my parents who spoiled me, buying me such a massive amount of candy and toys on both Christmas and Easter. I was never able to focus on one new thing for very long. I'd play with something for about three minutes, throw it down, then on to the next. It was no surprise to my parents of the large amount of energy and excitement that came from my little anxious self on this particular night before Easter. I was eight years old at the time. I was very small, slightly shorter than most of my friends, something completely overlooked by myself at that time. After finally calming me down if I'd have to guess what was about two straight hours of excitement, my parents were able to get me settled down and into my bed. My room was on the opposite end of the house as my parents. It was closer to the front door, just down a hall. To get to my parents, you'd have to go through the kitchen, then down another hall that turned to the right. I decided I'd stay up as late as possible, hopefully getting a glimpse of that giant bunny every kid I knew dreamed of meeting. Of course, my mother had taken me to get my picture taken with Santa and the Easter Bunny, but I knew they weren't the real ones. Only the real ones came to my house, and I knew that. I made a trip wire that led from my room, around the living room, back to my room, which was connected to a toy gun trigger. I had the gun under my pillow and knew it would be just loud enough to wake me up if I fell asleep waiting. I was only about 30 minutes in when I fell asleep. The sound of my toy gun going off suddenly woke me up. I jumped out of bed and quietly ran to my door, opening it and peering out into the darkness. I could hardly see out into the living room. Only faint light from the moon shining through the windows was bright enough for me to see something moving around. It was being quiet. This had to be the Easter Bunny. I walked into the living room as quietly and slowly as possible. I did not want him to see me and disappear. By now I could see the silhouette of him. He stopped. He was frozen in place. He must have seen me, but he did not disappear. He walked right up to me. It was as if he was happy to see me. The Easter Bunny, a giant to me at 612F tall, stood there right in front of me staring right into my eyes. His big rabbit face with a huge grin on it. No sooner than I started to say hello, he grabbed me, holding my mouth closed shut. His grip was so firm it hurt me. Tears started filling my eyes, and he drug me outside and into a small cargo trailer that was hooked onto the back of a truck. He threw me onto what looked to be some kind of metal makeshift bed. It was dark in there. The only source of light I saw was coming from a flashlight hanging from the ceiling. He tied my wrist to the bed and tried to force me to drink this clear liquid. It had no taste. But as it entered my mouth, I let it flow out of my mouth, down the sides of my cheeks, and onto the back of my head. He must not have noticed because he didn't say anything. I started to feel a little strange and sleepy, not strong enough to put me to sleep, but enough to where I just relaxed and closed my eyes leaving them open just enough to get a glimpse of exactly where I was. That's when he took his head off, but instead of nothing being there, there was a man's head. The Easter Bunny is really an old man dressed as a bunny? I didn't understand. He looked away and said something into a walkie-talkie that really scared me. He's out. Why did this man want me asleep so bad? I rolled my eyes around enough to see that I was not the only kid in there. I counted four more lining the wall beside me. They were all sleeping. None of them had woken up from all that noise we made getting into the trailer. But how? I lay quiet and motionless. All I could think to do was play dead. I was shut up in a trailer, so I knew I couldn't go anywhere. I could see there was a huge map with pictures above the kids, but it was too dark to make out what all that was. After what seemed like forever, I felt the bottom part of the trailer bump pretty hard on one side and we started bouncing up and down. I heard the man cuss and get on the walkie-talkie again, saying, We had a blowout on the trailer. We came to a slow stop, and the man opened the trailer door enough to peek out. I heard a It's clear come through the walkie-talkie. The man got out of the trailer, shutting the doors behind him. I heard some muffled talking, and then the trailer started rising on one side, 
I sat up, realizing my hands were still tied to the bed. Being my small self, I was actually able to free my wrists pretty easily. I thought this had to be my only chance of escaping. If I stayed, what was a man going to do to a little guy like me? Something just clicked in my head and I got up and bolted out the door. Thankfully, there was a row of houses right across the street. I didn't look back, but I could hear the footsteps behind me. They were catching up, and I really thought they were going to get me. Somehow, with that thought, I was able to outrun them. I ran to the only house I saw with lights on. It was miraculously unlocked. I opened the door without knocking, slamming, and locking it behind me. I fell to the floor and started crying. I heard a guy outside say, Damn it! We have to get out of here now! I must have made enough noise to get the family's attention, which lived in the house. A man came out first holding a gun, but put it back into his room after realizing it was only me. Then the lady came out, followed by two young kids. The adults ran over to me asking me what had happened. I explained everything as best as I could, only being eight. By the time the man understood and looked out the window, the truck was gone. I told them my parents' names, and they were able to look them up in a phone book and called them. They tried to explain, but my parents were too shocked that I was gone to even listen to the whole story. They got the address of where I was and came right over. It took them about 30 minutes to get there. My parents thanked the family profusely and took me home. My parents must have watched me sleep because when I woke up, they were both sitting at the foot of my bed, calm but in tears. By then, the news of that truck with kids had gone live, and there were search parties across three counties, including ours. Everyone else had the typical news articles and stories to go by from TV and newspaper. I never saw the news story. Those men were busted that afternoon. Someone ended up seeing the story on the news and spotted the truck and trailer, followed them, and reported it. I never knew the extent of what really happened for years. On the night of my 18th birthday, I told my parents I wanted to know what they knew. I thought it was perfectly reasonable since now I was an adult. They agreed and went on to tell me a story that soon brought them both back to the tears they once cried before. When my parents started to leave the house to come get me from the family's house I ran into, they found that our door lock had been broken. There were two men in their forties with that truck and trailer. They were found, stopped out on a secluded dirt road about an hour away from where I lived. Reports said they were hiding there not knowing they were being followed. Inside the trailer were four kids, still passed out in the same row I saw them in when I was in there. Thankfully they were all okay. There was a huge map with five kids' pictures on various parts of it, including me. The pictures were in the place of where we lived. Our pictures had been X'd out after they picked us up. They were using Rohypnol to knock all of the kids out and just redosing them when they started to come to. That's all the information the men confessed to. So where they were taking us or what they were going to do to us in that trailer is still a mystery today. Turns out, the driver of that truck was my uncle. I should have listened to the old wives' tales about not going out after midnight on Easter morning. If I had stayed home instead of wandering around the small rural town of Dry Creek that night, Maybe I wouldn't have uncovered the horrific secrets surrounding this twisted village's dark Easter rituals. It had been a quiet Easter weekend up until the night of the 21st. My wife Sarah and I were visiting her parents who lived out in the middle of nowhere Pennsylvania. They resided in Dry Creek, one of those blink and you'll miss it towns with a few hundred residents, a couple of churches, a dollar store, and not much else. Sarah's family has lived in Dry Creek for generations tracing their ancestry back to the town's Puritan founders in the 1600s. Her father Jacob is a deacon at the local Presbyterian church and her mom Martha is well known for baking award-winning pies that she sells at the church bake sales. We spent Easter Sunday having a big family dinner with her extended relatives. Afterwards, most of them attended an evening service at the Presbyterian church. However, Sarah and I opted out claiming we were tired from the drive-in from Philadelphia. The truth was, 
I'm not very religious and find church services mind-numbingly boring. Sarah was raised Presbyterian, but has become more agnostic like me in recent years. We made an excuse to get out of going, expecting to have a quiet evening at home. Around 11 p.m., Sarah's parents and relatives returned from the church services. From the sounds of animated talking and laughter, it seemed like they may have had a few too many Easter wine coolers during the fellowship hour after the service. Not wanting to be around Sarah's tipsy relatives, I decided to go out for a walk to get some fresh air and explore the quiet rural town. Sarah opted to stay behind, wanting to rest up for our drive back to Philly in the morning after the long weekend. Don't be out too late, she warned as I stepped out the front door into the cool spring night air. You know how my parents get nervous if we're out wandering around after midnight on Easter? I chuckled at her parents' silly small-town superstitions. Don't worry, I'll be back before any ghosts or goblins can get me, I teased. If only I had listened. Dry Creek is the quintessential rural village that seems frozen in time. The houses all look like they were built centuries ago. Weather-worn clapboard structures with dark wooden beams. The streets are narrow, lined with gas lamps that cast a dim glow. The quiet is so serene that it almost feels eerie, like you're walking through a ghost town. As I strolled down Dry Creek's main street, I couldn't help but be creeped out by the desolate, abandoned feeling. For a small town, there wasn't a soul around aside from the occasional horse and buggy. I figured maybe everyone was home resting after the big Easter church services. Up ahead, I saw the warm glow of some lights on in a building up the street. Getting closer, I realized it was the Dry Creek Presbyterian Church that Sarah's family attended. That's weird, I thought. I figured after the big services earlier, everyone would be home asleep. I walked up to the heavy wooden doors and peered through the windows. Sure enough, there were crowds of people inside shouting and cheering. From the sounds of it, there seemed to be some sort of party or celebration going on inside. A bit perplexed that there was another church event going on this late at night, I nevertheless pulled open the door and stepped inside, figuring I could pop in for a bit to do some casual anthropological rubbernecking. As soon as I walked into the church's dim, candlelit interior, I was met with a horrifying scene of depravity and chaos. The pews were overturned, carpets stained with blood, and human body parts were strewn about the room. In the middle of it all was a baying crowd encircled around a makeshift stage set up in front of the pulpit. They jumped up and down in rapt, frenzied excitement while whooping and hollering wildly. My eyes went wide with shock as I saw Sarah's parents, Jacob and Martha, standing on the stage in the middle of the pulsating throng. They were naked except for being smeared head to toe with crimson blood, chunks of flesh dangling from their stringy hair. Between Jacob and Martha was a young woman lying on an upturned pew, trembling and whimpering in fear as she sobbed uncontrollably. Her hands and feet were bound to the wooden pew with rope, leaving her completely immobile. I watched in mute horror as Jacob and Martha began chanting in some strange arcane language almost sounding like Latin or Greek. Their chanting grew louder and more intense, spittle flying from their mouths as the bloodthirsty crowd stomped and clapped along with their bizarre ritual. Suddenly Martha reached down and produced a long knife that seemed to appear out of nowhere. The wicked-looking blade gleamed with an almost palpable malevolence in the flickering candlelight. Martha cackled like a demented witch as she grabbed a fistful of the young woman's blonde hair and yanked her head back exposing her pale, quivering throat. The trapped victim whimpered and let out a terrified squeal as she saw the razor-sharp edge being lowered towards her. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Was Martha about to slit this woman's throat in front of the whole deranged congregation? I felt like I was either in the grips of a fever dream or stumbled onto the set of some avant-garde snuff film. This couldn't actually be happening, could it? Just as the wicked blade was about to slice into the woman's supple neck, Martha seemed to notice me standing in the back of the church. She abruptly stopped and turned her demented, demonic gaze towards me. 
an inhuman look of rage boiling up inside her crazed eyes. Zack, she shrieked, her hellish banshee cry echoing off the church walls. What are you doing here? The ritualistic chanting and chaos immediately ceased as every head in the congregation snapped around to face me. Sarah's aunts, uncles, cousins, and other relatives that just hours ago were sitting around the dining room table saying, Grace all turned towards me with the same murderous look as Martha and Jacob. He has violated the sanctity of our ceremony, Jacob bellowed spittle flying from his lips. The Easter feast cannot be defiled by the eyes of the impure. With those words, the bloodthirsty mob surged towards me like a crashing tsunami of flailing limbs and gnashing teeth. Wild-eyed and deranged, Sarah's sweet doting aunties and little cousins transformed into a horde of shrieking maniacs, their eyes glowing with zealous malice. I turned and ran as fast as I could, the chilling howls of the rampaging cult hot on my heels. Throwing open the heavy wooden doors, I burst out into the chilly night air and sprinted down the dark streets with no real plan of where to go. I pumped my legs as hard as I could, whipping my head back to see the blood-drenched mass of bodies gaining ground behind me. In the dim glow of the street lamps, I could see dozens of demented faces twisted up in sadistic glee, clearly enraptured by the thrill of the hunt. Up ahead I saw a sign in the darkness, Carson's Farm and Feed. Without thinking, I veered off and ran up the dirt road towards the large barn in the distance. Maybe I could take shelter inside and barricade myself. I threw open the barn doors only to be met with a stomach-churning smell of rotting meat and feces. Rows of rusting animal stalls lined the interior, long since abandoned and caked in layers of dirt, grime, and dried blood. My eyes slowly adjusted to the dim lighting only to see dozens of unmoving bodies strewn about the floor of the barn. They were in varying states of decay and mutilation, some messily impaled on meat hooks hanging from the rafters above. It looked like a sadistic abattoir, a horrific house of slaughter that made my stomach lurch. I doubled over and vomited on the grimy floorboards, fighting off waves of dizziness and horror. As I wiped the tears and bile from my eyes, I saw an ominous shadow pass in front of the barn doors. I whipped around to see several towering, inhuman figures silhouetted in the doorway. They were easily over eight feet tall and wider than any human form, their massive girth blocking out the light from outside. What have we here? One of the hulking entities rumbled in a voice that felt like it was scraping against the inside of my skull. Does this one wish to join our ceremony? I shrieked in terror and bolted out the back of the barn, not looking back at the monstrosities silently lumbering inside. I sprinted blindly through the darkness of the night, jumping over fences and cutting through fields in a futile attempt to escape this insane town. After what felt like an eternity of non-stop running, I finally spotted a main road up ahead and made a beeline for it. My lungs were on fire, legs trembling from exhaustion, but I pushed through the agony with only one goal in mind, getting as far away from this place as possible. As I burst out onto the dark two-lane highway, a young couple in a pickup truck immediately slammed on their brakes and grinded to a halt just a few feet in front of me. Oh my god! The girl in the passenger seat gasped as I stumbled up to their window. Are you okay? You look like you just saw a ghost. Ghost? More like a fucking demon straight from hell. I panted deliriously between shuddering breaths. Please, you have to get me away from this place before they find me. The girl's eyes went wide in confusion and fear at my manic ramblings. Her boyfriend in the driver's seat urgently leaned over and shouted, Hey man, just get in the truck and we'll get out of here. Not wasting a second, I clambered into the bed of the truck as the wheels kicked up loose gravel and we peeled away into the night. I watched anxiously out of the truck's rear window as the cursed town of Dry Creek quickly disappeared into the darkness behind us. As the old Baptist church steeples melted away into the night, part of me breathed a massive sigh of relief that I escaped with my life from that nightmarish village. But the other part of me knew that the scars of what I saw there would never fully heal. Ever since that harrowing Easter night, I've been racked with sleepless nights, 
haunted by the blood-curdling images that are forever burned into my psyche. What dark, unspeakable pagan rituals was that insane cult carrying out under the false piety of Christianity? What inhuman cosmic abominations were they summoning within those hallowed church walls? And who was the poor young woman fated to meet a brutal death at the hands of my wickedly unhinged in-laws? Perhaps it's better that I never uncover the full truth about the depravities I witnessed that night. Some mysteries once disturbed only lead down a path of eternal damnation. All I know is that from now on, I'll be observing every Easter from the safety of my home, door and windows locked tight from the horrors lurking outside once the clock strikes midnight. If you're reading this and find yourself out on a quiet country road next Easter Eve, be careful which small towns you stumble into after dark. The old legends of pagan fertility rituals and human sacrifices might have more truth than you ever realized.